And we're going to have Michal Arachko. We are very honored to have him here. He has a very impressive educational record. When you, when you look at his CV that we have on the website, it was very, very impressive to look at. He's educated uh, at Imperial College London, where he studied physics. It's one of the world's best universities. And even during high school, he went to the International um, Ast Astronomical Olympiad. And um, now he works a lot with Python, and he's going to be talking about distributed energy resource simulation and optimization in the context of a transmission grid. And when he's not talking about PyCon and Python, you can see him playing drums, right? <laughs> so he has a lot of very varied interests. So Michal, give it away. Give it away for Michal. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So I hope uh, everybody's got a refreshing lunch. And it's important because um, this presentation is going to be full of energy because it's um, based about distributed energy resources. So yeah, um, a bit uh, of interaction uh, beyond what uh, uh, was already said. So yeah, I switched from physics uh, to software some six years ago. And since that, um, I've been working on many different projects. Uh, both within startup environments and uh, corporate environments as well. Um, and fun fact about me, so whenever I come to a cafe, um, then they ask me uh, what kind of coffee do I drink, but I always get confused and my response is always just 418. Um, that said, uh, currently I've been working for a company named Makers, um, which is a nice company working on IoT projects um, all around the globe. Um, they work from the hardware level all the way up to data collection, analysis, and uh, uh, application of the data science results to actually optimization of, of the portfolios of their clients. Um, and one of the projects we've been working on um, is for a company named uh, Blueprint Power, um, which is a US-based company that uh, essentially provides um, energy solutions for buildings, um, installing those distributed energy resources into different buildings and therefore reducing their both energy costs and CO2 emissions, um, which is obviously much more than needed uh, in this, shall we say, climate. Um, moving on, what is this talk going to be about? So first, um, I'll give a brief introduction what Transmission Grid is, um, how it currently operates and um, how it's going to evolve towards the future. Um, then I'll briefly touch upon what distributed, distributed energy resources are, um, what the relationships are. Um, then I'll move into uh, Pleiades, which is um, our custom framework which we use for simulations of those distributed energy resources. Um, finally, I'll provide um, an example of a photovoltaic array or a simulation of a photovoltaic array. So, yeah. That's going to be uh, light as well in this, uh, in this talk. Uh, and at the very end, there'll, there'll be place for, for your questions. So let's move on. So first, um, what the transmission grid is. So as you probably know, uh, electricity is generated usually far away from where it is actually consumed um, in power plants, such as um, nuclear power plants, coal-fired power plants, uh, perhaps hydroelectric plants. Uh, but all of those would be usually placed somewhere in the countryside, and then the electricity would be consumed in the towns and cities, um, in either residential, commercial, or industrial customers. Um, and so uh, the electricity needs to be transmitted uh, from the uh, point of generation to the uh, end users. And the way this is done is uh, via these transmission lines, which we, uh, we are kind of familiar with. Um, so there usually would be some kind of step-up transformer at the side of the power plant, which increases the voltage um, all the way up to either 230 or even 400 kilovolts um, in order to reduce the losses during the transmission. Um, then uh, the electricity flows uh, over the transmission lines and then there are step-down transformers that transform the electricity uh, or the, the high voltage back to, to the voltages we used to, so at the very end to the familiar 230 uh, volts uh, in Europe or 115 in, in the US. Um, the bottom line here is that there is no such thing as a uh, electricity storage. 
um, at least not uh, on a large enough scale that would be applicable to the transmission grid. So instead, the transmission grid needs to rely on um, a very fine balance between uh, the supply and demand. Um, and that balance needs to be kept at all times because any deviation from that would uh, essentially cause changes in frequency of the grid. Uh, that would consequently cause the circuit breakers to break um, or to disconnect the uh, individual assets from the grid, essentially resulting in um, what's called a blackout or essentially um, no service at all. So how do the grid operators make sure this doesn't happen? So let us have a look on how uh, a typical energy um, demand curve uh, during a day might look like. So that's what's shown in the right-hand side of the uh, slide. So usually uh, that there will be uh, this amount of en energy that's consumed at all times, uh, which is referred to as uh, base load. Um, and that would be provided by uh, big power plants for, such as um, nuclear power plants or coal-fired power plants. Um, things that can be, um, can provide the energy at relatively low cost, uh, but can't really be switched on and off very efficiently. Um, and so they do the heavy lifting of, of actually providing this base load for, for, for the transmission grid. And then the other part is uh, kind of demand peaks that happen to uh, be centered somewhere around working hours where the demand for the electricity is at its highest. Um, and that needs to be tackled by uh, other power plants uh, that can be switched on at a moment's notice. And those would be usually things like uh, gas turbines or diesel electric plants, or sometimes maybe um, hi uh, small hydroelectric plants. Um, but usually these will be uh, much more expensive to run um, and also would produce much more emissions than the, the base load. So obviously, uh, this brings incentives not only to reduce the total consumption of electricity at the client side, but also to re reduce the peak demand they have, because this way we can sa save both the uh, both the um, price. Oh, sorry, uh, both their energy bills and also sorry, reduce their energy bills and reduce also their uh, carbon, carbon footprint. Um, now let's have a look how the grid operates currently and how it will have evolved towards the future. Um, so traditionally, the grid uh, was kind of meant to support this one-way flow of energy from the power plant to the uh, end customer. That's what's shown on the left-hand side. Um, but things are changing, and as people gradually add more and more distributed devices in, uh, into the grid or distributed energy resources into the grid, such as um, photovoltaic panels um, or other things, uh, energy storage, uh, el um, electric vehicle charges, etc. Um, the grid starts to be more distributed, and it's more of like multiple microgrids that are connected uh, together, and the energy flow might be much more back and forth than what's uh, what, it usually, what what we were used to. Um, now let's have a look on what the distributed energy resources are. Um, so essentially anything that can either produce or store energy locally at the client side or let's say in their buildings uh, would be referred to as a distributed energy resource. So these could be, for example, wind turbines or natural gas turbines, uh, batteries, um, and also photovoltaic panels, which I'll touch on later. So obviously all of these devices uh, produce a lot of data from their operations which can be then collected and analyzed and leveraged to actually optimize the, the performance of the portfolio of, of the clients. So obviously this brings a huge uh, opportunities for, for us as uh, developers of, of these systems. Um, now let's have a look on what those relationships among those distributed energy resources might be. So usually a client would have a, a portfolio of, of buildings they have. Um, then those buildings might have different um, assets connected to them, um, for example, photovoltaic arrays, and then those assets might also contain other small assets, for example, individual um, solar panels or individual batteries, electric vehicle chargers, etc. So obviously, this brings uh, a huge complexity in, in the relationships among the, the assets, um, as is depicted 
in, in the picture on, on the right-hand side, um, as well as many different energy variables that needs to be uh, taken account for in, in our simulations. So we need to keep in mind this when, when actually doing the simulations. Um, and moving on, this is when I actually came up with this idea to prepare a, a kind, kind of custom framework for this that would handle all of those issues which I just mentioned. Um, because when I came to the company, um, there were some uh, simulation engines, but they would usually uh, kind of depend on, so each of those models would kind of depend on the previous ones. Um, and it would be kind of fairly non-trivial to update those models or add new, um, new simulated devices into that. So I was essentially, I came, with this, came up with this idea to, to prepare some kind of framework that would uh, make the work much easier. Um, so we named it Pleiades um, after the Pleiades cluster, which uh, there is a photo of it. Uh, I've taken um, this uh, uh, early in this, uh, this year's January. Um, and so the question is how does, how does it actually improve our work? Um, so I would say there are multiple things uh, it does. So the very first, first thing is that it provides kind of a uh, uniform interface for all the simulated devices. So that kind of makes it much easier to uh, take results from one simulation and use it in, in, the in, uh, in another simulated device. Um, then it kind of under the hood uh, addresses the, the huge complexity which I mentioned. So uh, I'll show that later, how we can actually model the different relationships among those uh, distributed energy resources. Um, it provides a simple way to aggregate the data, which is also a thing which we do on a daily basis. Um, and it's very, very easy to use for, for the end user. So even a um, and non-experienced non, non programmer would be able to um, define their own models and run their own simulations using this framework. Um, and most importantly, it comes with uh, words, don't panic written in big friendly letters in its readme. So let's have a look on what the framework is actually based uh, around, and that's uh, this data structure which we call Time Tensor. Um, it's essentially a 3D tabular data structure where we have uh, tables stuck on top of each other. Each of those tables represents um, a given variable, for example, a, um, a, uh, some type of energy that's, that's uh, simulated for the, the, the given device. It could be electricity or natural gas, um, or, or something else. Um, those tables would be, well, not surprisingly, pandas data frames. Um, and then we attach two more indices to them. Um, one is what we call time index. The other is, is period index. So the time index would be the familiar uh, date time index from pandas. Period index would be kind of tailor-made uh, index that um, I'll touch on that later, what it does, um, and how it actually simplifies the um, the tasks we uh, we need to face when, or the, the tasks we do during our uh, daily jobs. Um, yeah, so so that's about that's about it. Uh, maybe later we can touch on it uh, during, uh, during the Q and A session. Um, now let's have a have a look on a concrete example of how we can actually use this framework um, to model something. Um, to prepare like a, a simple model of what would be a photovoltaic uh, panel. Um, so obviously, um, if we want to do this, um, first we need to start with the sun. Um, so as we all know, the sun orbits the earth around the circle that's called uh, ecliptic and it does one orbit uh, per year. Or for those who happen to be born after Copernicus, we know it's the other way around. But uh, the concept is the same. Uh, the circle of, of ecliptic is still there on our sky and the sun moves along it um, during the year. So that's what we are going to, to simulate. And actually, sorry, a disclaimer first. So this is not, by no means going to be any like production grade model. It's going to be a, a fairly kind of toy model which will just depict, it, depict how uh, the framework can be used for this. Right, so uh, let's go ahead and try to actually model uh, the motion of the sun in our sky. Um, so yeah, we can actually uh, use basic astronomy to essentially uh, get an equation of, of, of motion for, for the sun, um, which in this case uh, will account for both the elliptical orbit of the Earth around the sun and also uh, for what's called mutation, which is kind of 
wiggling around the rotation axis of the Earth. Um, so that's what we did in, um, in this function, which you can see here. Um, and then the first thing we need to do before actually running that, fun or actually calculating the coordinates, obviously, in every simulation, we need to prepare some kind of time grid for, uh, for which we want to evaluate the, the simulation. So that's what we did here in, in the left-hand side. Um, and as you can see, I used the time tensor structure. Um, it has kind of familiar interface for anybody who's, uh, um, who's familiar with uh, NumPy and, and Pandas. Well, actually, I kind of um, took a deep dive into the Pandas' um, uh, code base before I actually started working on, on this and kind of was, was trying to make it as similar as possible to um, what we would be used to with, with Pandas and also NumPy. So in this case, we can use the, the zeros method to kind of arrange, um, not an array, but this kind of structure which I described for, for the time range we want to use for our simulation. So in this case, we can see that uh, on the time axis, we have um, days in a year, uh, starting from 1st January, then 2nd January, going all the way down to uh, 31st December of that year. And then the period axis, which I mentioned, uh, represents the periods within a day. So in this case, it would be daily, sorry, uh, um, hourly periods within a day. So for example, the first box would, uh, or first element of, of that um, index would, would represent uh, the period from, uh, from midnight to 1 a.m. Then the, the next one would be from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. all the way down to the next midnight. So that's roughly how the data structure looks like. Um, and then we can actually use the, um, well, the function which I described to simulate the motion of the, of the sun. Um, it returns the ecliptic longitude and, longi uh, longitude and latitude of the sun. Um, and we can assign it to the, the time tensor object, which in this case will represent the sun or its position in the sky during the year or for, for all, uh, all those timestamps which, which I showed here. Um, so uh, let's visualize how the result looked like. Uh, in this case, so again, we can just print out the uh, the object, and it will kind of show what's uh, what's in it. Uh, it's again kind of inspired by uh, what pandas data frames do when when we print them out. So we can see the variables that are stored in the object, and then we can see that um, all the timestamps um, have been filled with the corresponding values. Um, we can also visualize the results. Uh, there is a convenience method to series which obviously returns pandas series corresponding to the given variable. Um, and we can just inspect how the sun moves in the sky during the, the course of a year. Um, so what we can see is that uh, the, la the, the, the ecliptic longitude uh, increases almost linearly over the course of a year, which is, well, what we would expect. Um, there is a special day, which happens to be uh, 30, sorry, 21st March. Uh, which is obviously the vernal equinox that's uh, also defined as um, the start of the coordinate system. Um, and it's essentially when uh, the point where, where the sun actually crosses the equator um, in, in the spring. Um, and obviously the ecliptic lat latitude uh, doesn't change because ecliptic is the circle which sun moves on in our sky. So obviously sun doesn't deviate from, from that, at least not in a simple example. Right, so let's move on. Um, what we need to do next is uh, a few coordinate transforms. Uh, we need to transform uh, from the ecliptic coordinate system to what's called equatorial coordinate system. Um, the principle is almost the same. Um, it's still static with respect to the stars, um, but the, the base circle there is, is uh, uh, the Earth's equator rather than um, the ecliptic. So. That's a fairly simple thing to do. We just need to shift the, the, uh, the coordinate system by 23.5 degrees, which is, by the way, the inclination of the Earth uh, rotation axis to, to the ecliptic. So that's what we do here. Um, again, we can just assign those uh, two variables to the time tensor object. Um, we can see that the, the, the names for those variables is uh, right ascension and declination, uh, which is the name of the variables within the, the, the uh, equatorial coordinate system, but they are essentially um, conceptually similar to uh, the longitude and latitude, respectively. Um, and finally, having the position on the, of, the, of the sun in the sky 
Uh, in this coordinate system, we can transform to local coordinate. So essentially, we can calculate the position of the sun for um, for any given point uh, on the Earth uh, for for the time range of the simulation, which we, which we might want to run. So in this case, um, I chose the center of the universe, which happens to be Jelena. Um, I also <laughs> happen to be living there, and so, but that's not why I chose that particular city. Um, so we can assign the sun's uh, azimuth, which is again a coordinate that we would be fairly familiar with, um, and also uh, the sun's altitude above the horizon um, to the time tensor, which uh, at this point represents the, the, the point where the photovoltaic panel would be placed. Um, yeah, we need to provide uh, the, not just the uh, coordinates in, in the uh, equatorial coordinate system, but also the, the, the timestamps for which we want to calculate that, but as a detail of, of that function, which, uh, which I'm not going to dive into. So uh, having this, having the positions of the sun in the sky uh, for all the timestamps of our simulation, we need to validate the simulation somehow. Um, so the very first thing I would like to show uh, is what's called analemma. Um, that's essentially a shape created by the sun over the course of a year. Um, and uh, the, the longer axis is caused by um, the changes in the declination of the sun. Um, and the, the smaller one is, uh, is due to the elliptical orbit of the Earth around the sun. Uh, and the left-hand side picture shows um, actually a real photo of, of that effect. And then this is what, what uh, our simple simulation yielded at this point. Apart from this, um, I actually compared the positions of the sun for some random selected uh, times uh, with uh, kind of astronomy software and actually found that uh, the prediction was to within 10 uh, arc minutes to the actual position, which means that uh, the, the simulation was precise enough that uh, we always were within the, the, the solar disk um, of where the, the real position of the sun would be. Um, now having this, um, let's visualize how the sun's altitude above the horizon changes over the course of a year. So we can just plot the time series um, of that vari variable. So that's what I did here. Um, and it's absolutely obvious what's going on, isn't it? Um, actually, no. It's really hard to spot uh, when we have both uh, daily and yearly variations, because, because the daily variations uh, almost completely obscure the general picture. So we wouldn't be able to tell whether the um, where the shape of, of the daily variation is the same, let's say, in, in the summer and in the winter, or whether there, there are any differences, um, without actually zooming in, into, which we would normally do. Um, but uh, the time tensor data structure comes handy again uh, in, at, this, at this point, uh, because we can split the variations uh, between the two axes, which I mentioned. So we can see that the, the daily variations are shown on this period axis. And then the, the daily variation, oh, sorry, the, the variations along the, um, or during the, the course of a year would be uh, plot, would be shown on, on this other axis, um, the, the time time axis. So we can obviously see that, uh, uh, or immediately, immediately see that the um, the sun reaches its its highest point uh, during the summer. Actually, during the summer solstice, that's probably not surprising, and somewhere around noon. Not exactly, uh, because uh, the Earth's orbit is, is an ellipse. Um, the opposite happens during the winter solstice, which is somewhere here, uh, when the sun reaches on only about 20 degrees above the horizon, and it spends most of the, of the day below the horizon, which is, again, something we're familiar with. Um, so actually, having this, um, the only thing we need to add is uh, atmospheric variation or atmospheric effects. Uh, one of which would, could be um, what's called uh, extinction of light within the atmosphere. Uh, essentially, the light beam gets exponentially fainter uh, as it travels through the atmosphere. So, from like simple geometry, we can calculate the like the length of of the the beam or the slab of of air which it needs to uh, travel through. That would be one thing. Um, and then, obviously, we would need to add all the other effects, like um, diffusion of light within the atmosphere, clouds, um, maybe some 
um, added parameters, which I'm not going to do at this point uh, because it's just like, as I said, a very like a toy example of of how we would use the framework. But let's move on and actually try to define a um, well a distributed energy resource that would re uh, that re would represent the uh, the photovoltaic array. Um, so for this, we can actually use uh, uh, the interface, sorry, uh, which I defined in, in the asset base class. Um, the only thing we need to do at this point is to actually wrap the logic, uh, which I just mentioned, into this um, kind of child class of, of the asset base class. Um, and then most of, um, of the things which I, or most of the issues which I mentioned earlier would be handled by the interface itself. Um, I'll show that later. So let's have a look on the very first thing. So here I just created um, an object of, of that uh, class, defining the, um, well, its, its peak load, um, and then also some other parameters which need to be provided to the model. Um, and then to run the simulation and check its results, we need to call the um, um, profile property of that object that under the hood actually runs the simulation and returns uh, the result of the simulation, um, which is shown here uh, on the right-hand side of, of, the, of the slide. So we can see that the, the, um, the, um, the photovoltaic panel actually produces most of its energy during the noon at summer because of the angle I, I set it uh, at. Um, and we also have this sign convention where we define uh, electricity production as negative consumption, um, just to make sure that the, the signs are consistent among all the energy assets which we might want to simulate within um, whatever simulations we might, might want to run. So this is how we actually run the simulation um, at this uh, single asset. Now the next thing we need to do is to actually combine different assets into the structure which I mentioned earlier. So that's what we do here. Um, there are multiple ways how to do this. Um, so the first one is shown uh, on the very right-hand side of, of the slide. So there I took uh, four of those photovoltaic panel uh, models and wrapped them into um, what I call a container, which is essentially just, well, just a container for models um, and created this photovoltaic array uh, model. Um, and then I've done the same thing for a simulation or, or model of, of a battery um, essentially wrapping three batteries into an array of batteries. And then later on, um, I defined a model of, of a building and added those two arrays in, into the building uh, using the et child method. Um, so this is essentially all we need to do to define the relationships among the, uh, the assets we have in our simulation. Um, sorry for not actually diving into the code of, of the battery or, or the building. Um, but I think that's beyond the scope of this presentation. So let's just move on and check the results of the simulation. Um, so the first thing we might want to analyze is the individual contributions of those assets within our simulation. So to do this, um, uh, I wrote this uh, traverse method, uh, which essentially traverses the subtree of, of the asset and um, applies whatever um, aggregation method we want. Uh, on, on the, the results of the simulations. So in this case, um, I, should, uh, I applied, um, so that's the, the, the uh, peak load of those assets uh, displayed uh, in uh, their relative sizes and actually uh, absolute value of that. Um, so we can see that the, the biggest load is, always, uh, is, um, is the building itself. Uh, it consumes most of the energy. Um, then we have the photovoltaic array, which produces energy. Um, but yeah, I, 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 uh, I took uh, an absolute value, so, uh, so it's the same sign. But uh, the graph actually shows the, the, the comparison between uh, the individual, among the individual assets. And then as you can see here, then the batteries also provide um, some contribution to, to the final energy profile of the, of the building. Um, now, uh, let's run the, the whole simulation or let's try to get the, the final result of the simulation, which obviously would be the time series of the, um, of the building or the consumption of electricity by the building um, as it would be measured by a meter that is attached to it. 
So to do this, we again just need to call the profile um, property of, of that um, object. And what it does again, it, it trousers the tree of, of all the assets that are assigned to that building. Um, it runs the simulations, combines the results in a proper way, um, and then returns the results again as a time tensor object, um, which I displayed here. So we can see the, the, the different, uh, or the variations in, in, in the consumption over the course of a year. Um, again, uh, we can inspect the variations in, uh, during the, the individual days, or we can just rotate the, the image and uh, analyze the yearly variation of the consumption. And this obviously takes into account all those uh, assets that are already connected to the building. Um, and so this is what I enjoy about Python really, that um, kind of um, advanced enough engineers can uh, build tools that are both simple to use for, for the final user. So in this example, even a, a non-experienced programmer would be able to define the, the model uh, or the simulation they want to run and actually run it, obtain the results and display them. Um, and also, uh, powerful things or powerful tools um, as we are kind of used with all, we're used to with all, all, all the other libraries we know from Python, even for example, Pandas. Um, it's a really powerful thing, yet fairly simple to use. Um, okay, so now um, let me introduce uh, the company again. Uh, if you found this topic interesting, then please visit, visit our hiring page. Uh, there are a few open position. I would be looking forward to uh, getting in touch with you, getting in touch with you. Um, and also there is a contest which we prepared for you. Um, I'm pretty sure those uh, questions would be fairly easy to answer for you because you're all experts, unlike me. Um, and yeah, thank you for your attention and it's now time for your questions. Okay, so we have a few questions. Uh, the one with the uh, the one that we that we have is the first. Is the framework open source? Uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, so no, currently it's not open source. Um, it's it's proprietary, obviously. Um, but yeah, we've got policies within the company that some some parts of the code base might get open source at some point. Um, yeah, it's, it's a perfectly valid question, and I would love to see it open source, but that's not the case yet. Uh, okay, is it uh, publicly available for testing, even if it's not open source? Is, is the code published somewhere? So um, I don't think so, uh, but maybe some of our tools will be publicly available at some point, but again, that's not a decision of mine. Okay, uh, next question. Let's say I want to get off the grid, and start using solar. First of all, is this a good idea? Uh, next, how do I start? Uh, what do I do? And then how do I geek out with Python in the process? Okay, uh, those are obviously great questions, but I'm not sure whether I'm, I'm the best person to answer those because um, I'm either an astronomer or a programmer, but by no way uh, like uh, somebody who would be familiar with installation of, of photovoltaic panels. Um, that said, um, I don't think it's a good idea to actually build um, like big enough uh, photovoltaic panel that would provide all the energy for you uh, and kind of making this kind of, uh, how do you call it, island um, setup. Um, instead, what, what's, what's, uh, what might be kind of better thing to do would be to keep connected to the grid and essentially do what, what our clients do. Um, and that's um, reducing your consumption during the day uh, maybe even like selling the energy to, to the grid if, if your contract actually allows that. Um, and then take advantage of, well, of the grid when, when the sun is not shining. Mm. And how do you geek up with Python? Um, so that's, a, again, a good question. So there are actually good, uh, quite good libraries. Uh, one is called uh, PVLab, I guess, um, which I would suggest having a look on. And then there are open source, uh, oh, sorry, not open source, but obviously, but um, APIs that can, can provide some rough estimates, um, even for like non-commercial use or for free. Um, so you can have a look on that as well, using Python, if you will. 
I don't know if that answers all the questions. Well, let me add one. Uh, well, let's say we are in the center of the universe, which means in Jelina, right? And um, uh, is, is, is it uh, the, the energy of the sun um, enough to, to, be, to be reasonable building, building out uh, uh, such a system? Uh, so I'm not sure what I, I got the question, but um, there, are, there are a few issues uh, with this. So if you, okay, if you were to take all your energy from the sun for, let's say, your house, I mean, that surely is possible, but you would need to have like a large battery which would store the energy because you need to account for, well, the fact that the sun doesn't shine over the night, obviously, um, and then they might be cloudy for, for a week and then you need to get the energy from somewhere. So, I mean, that's what you would use your, your big battery for, but then it's kind of, I mean, you can always, if, you, if you've got the, like, um, if you've got enough property, then you can build your photovoltaic arrays big enough to provide you all the energy, uh, electricity you need. Um, but I wouldn't say it's, it's a good idea to kind of separate from the grid. Uh, and the last question, position of the sun is presum presumably the most important factor. What are the other variables in the simulation? Clouds? Incline of panels, uh, failing panels. Yeah, that's a very good question. And actually, yeah, um, I probably should have gone into like more more detail into this. So obviously, the position of the sun determines the the angle of uh, of those. Er um, sorry, uh, the um, the in angle of incidence uh, to the the, the 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 solar panel. So if you have incidence that's not like normal incidence, but uh, at some angle then the effective area of, of, of that solar panel would be reduced by the cosine of that angle. So, so that's an important thing because that can like significantly, I mean, even a small angle could significantly decrease the amount of energy you get from, from the solar panel. Um, then, yeah, um, the, the, the question is whether you also want to move your solar panel to follow the, the sun to, to make sure that the, the incidence is, is always normal or whether you're happy with just having stationary panel. So yeah, that would be this, this geometry aspect. Uh, then, as I said, the, the extinction of, uh, of the light in, in, in the atmosphere. So um, if we were, let's say, directly, or if the sun was directly above our heads, then roughly 75% of, of the energy from the sun would get through the atmosphere uh, towards us. Um, if, we, if we tilt it a bit, uh, then the same thing well, applies, that the, like, the light rays need to pass through um, like longer slabs of, um, of the atmosphere. So that reduces the, the energy or the incoming energy uh, exponentially. Um, so that would be another, another effect. Then obviously diffusion uh, in the atmosphere. So if, um, if the atmosphere was uh, like completely clear, there would be no aerosols, uh, no crystals, then that would be, it, it, it would kind of uh, diffuse the, the, the light in, in one particular way. Then if we add aerosols there, then the, the diffusion is kind of, the, the principle is different. So, uh, even the amount of, uh, of light that, that gets through that uh, is different. Then obviously clouds. Um, and then, so those would be the atmospheric, uh, atmospheric variables. Then there are things that affect the, the efficiency of the solar panel itself. So that could be um, either temperature. So obviously those are semiconductors that operate at different efficiencies at different temperatures. So if uh, if the solar panel is heated to, let's say, 50 or 60 degrees centigrade, then that would operate much, much less efficiently than, let's say, at, at 20 or 30 degrees centigrade. Um, then obviously, if, if there's some uh, rainfall or snow uh, on the panel, that would also reduce the, the amount of power. Um, so all of these things make it, like, add more and more complexity to any simulations that would be done. But I'm pretty sure that there's a, there's a talk on uh, on actual simulations of actual photovoltaic panels tomorrow. So yeah, come along and I'm pretty sure they will explain that in much more detail than I did. Thank you. And I said this was the last question, but uh, in the meantime, one more appeared. Uh, would, you would you take another question? Uh, yeah, sure. Cool. Uh, 
this is about possible future directions uh, of the framework. So what about hybrid sources like wind turbine and, or a small water generator? Is the framework capable of that kind of simulation? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Actually, that, again, I should have mentioned that. So as I said, it provides the, the abstraction for, for the individual uh, models or for the individual resources. Um, and so, yeah, we can, we can add whatever mo models of whatever systems we want, as long as we know how to actually generate the time series of the, let's say, energy consumption or production they, they do. So for example, if we were to uh, simulate a, I don't know, a gas turbine, then we would need to provide it uh, the time series of the uh, available, well, uh, the natural gas, and then it might generate some electricity. So again, we need to define uh, within the, the, the model how actually, how it converts natural gas to electricity and how to actually dispatch that. So yeah, but the, the overall, like the, the, the interface is there, so we only need to define the logic that creates those time series for us. That's all we need to do. That was our last question. Let's give a big thank you to Michal Rachko. Thank you. Mikrobit je programovateľný milý počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládam tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.